Welcome everyone to today's webinar, How Yale and Stanford Hire and Retain Nurses Without Losing Them to Travel Agencies. On behalf of Becker's Healthcare, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we start off, I'm going to walk through just a few quick housekeeping instructions here. So first, we will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we will have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. So you can go ahead and submit any questions that you have throughout the webinar by typing them into that Q&A box you should see on your screen. Today's session is also being recorded, so it will be available after the event. And you can use that same link that you used to log in to today's webinar to access that recording once it's available. And if at any time you don't see your slides moving, or if you have trouble with the audio, just try refreshing your browser. You can also submit any technical questions into the Q&A box as well. We're here to help out with those. And with that, I'll now turn it over to Iman to introduce today's speakers. Thanks, Erica. Hey, everyone. Uh, so today we'll be talking about how Yale New Haven Health and how Yale New Haven Health and Stanford Healthcare hire and retain nurses without losing them to travel agencies. Um, my name is Iman Abu Zaid. I am uh, I'm an MD by background. I've been in healthcare technology for the last 10 years of my career, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Incredible Health. Incredible Health is the fastest growing uh, career marketplace for healthcare workers. Hospitals and health systems use our platform and our software to hire nurses in 20 days or less, when it normally takes 80 days or longer. So joining us today, we have Dory Manor. Uh, Dory is the Executive Director of Talent Acquisition at Yale New Haven Health. Do Dory has over 20 years of human resources experience and is responsible for driving hiring, in hiring initiatives across the health system for all clinical and non-clinical positions as well as the financial, operational, and managerial outcomes that directly relate to a higher quality of care for Yale, uh, Yale's patients and their families. Also, um, another speaker we have today uh, is David Jones. David Jones is the Chief HR Officer at Stanford Healthcare. He has over 30 years of experience in HR. He's led several large-scale organizational uh, change in HR transformation efforts. He's, he's a track record of driving business results through the development and execution of HR strategies in diverse industries, in e-commerce, financial services, academic medicine, and of course, in healthcare. Uh, David started at Stanford in early 2017, and he and his team have embarked on redefining and transforming the HR function to fundamentally shift how HR services are provided and how to leverage innovative technology and deliver an excellent employee experience. Uh, what I wanted to just mention before is that we know that Dory and David are from health systems with very huge brands. They're very well, Yale and Stanford are very, very well known in the market. They also have fantastic compensation. But regardless, even independent of the brand and the compensation, both of these leaders will be talking through how they hire permanent nurses and how they retain permanent nurses. And you'll see that it's a highly strategic effort and it's, it's very tactical as well. And they'll be sharing some of the some of the strategies and tactics that they've implemented in order to, to drive fantastic retention rates. I think over the last year, one of the top concerns that was highlighted by nursing and HR leaders across the country is uh, is retention challenges and losing nurses to, for example, travel agencies. So uh, every nursing leader and HR leader really had to step up the, in this last year and implement some new strategies and new thinking when it comes to hiring and, and, and retention. All right, so what we'll be covering today um, on the hiring topic, we'll be covering speed, we'll be covering uh, shift, you know, shift preferences and other flexible options and compensation and benefits. And then we'll switch over to retention and we'll be talking about, a, about career and educational advancement for nurses, as well as burnout and resilience and social connections at work. All right, so let's get a quick overview of what, what the problems are in the market. Uh, healthcare is the number one employment sector in the US since 2018, and one in eight Americans uh, works in healthcare. Our demand for healthcare as a country keeps going up because our, uh, our population is aging, um, but simply we, don't, we simply do not have enough workers in the system. And so we are all experiencing a, a very severe shortage of healthcare workers. That includes nurses and, and other uh, healthcare professions too. Uh, as far as the, the national data goes currently, we are on track to be 1 million nurses short by 2023. The annual turnover for acute care nurses today is at 19%, and labor as a percentage of revenue is at 
Uh, it is the highest it's ever it's ever been. We keep seeing labor costs go up. Um, in addition, um, we, the average time to fill a permanent and, and specialized nurse position is on average 82 days. So let's dive deeper into the topic of hiring. And uh, these are the, some of the considerations for nurses that are actively looking for, for a role. We collect quite a lot of this data on our platform. Some of the top reasons and, and top considerations when nurses are looking for a job they care deeply about speed, how quickly it is that they get that, that offer and how quickly the hiring processes are. They care about shift availability and flexible work options. They care, of course, about their compensation and their total benefits. And they care about their commute and location. Um, we're going to go deep on the first three, especially because, you know, we can't control commute and location as much as we'd like. But we can def definitely implement strategies and tactics for the first three. So first, we'd like to do a, a quick poll with everyone in the audience. Um, this is data from one of our markets. This is from the Los Angeles market. And these are three teams that are using the Incredible Health platform. Um, we have one hospital team, competitor A. They have the highest salaries in the market. Uh, we have competitor B, which has the biggest brands in the market. And then we have competitor C, which has the fastest speed in the market. That's speed to hire. And you can see uh, you know, the different steps in the hiring process across the top there and how, how much time candidates are spending between each step of the process. So the question for, for everyone, for the audience, and we'll start the poll in a second, is which of these teams is it A, B, or C that hires the most in a given time, in a given week or a given month? Uh, the A with the highest salaries, B with the biggest brand, or C with the fastest speed? So here is the poll. Everyone could submit your answers. Okay, and we got, we've got this, the, the uh, results now. And C, was, C is definitely the winner. <laughs> it's the team with the fastest speed that hires the most. They do not have the biggest brand in the market. They don't even have the highest compensation in the market. But they have just streamlined their operational processes to a point where uh, they are able to beat the market in terms of hiring speed. All right, so let's... So um, speed has definitely become a competitive advantage, especially in a labor market this tough. Um, the other data from the platform that we're seeing is that 68% of nurses are accepting the very first offer they receive, and 61% of nurses are accepting their first offer, even if the second or third offer has higher compensation. So there's some kind of desire from the nurses that, uh, you know, they're usually doing their job search experience while already employed, so they're quite busy already. And so they just want get, to get it, get, it, get it done as quickly as possible. And it also creates a fantastic uh, impression and first impression for the employer to get through the hiring process fast because that speaks hugely. That's like the front door, right? It's the front door to the health system is the hiring process. And so when, it, when it's streamlined and quick, it, it, it uh, reflects very well on the rest of the health system. All right. I'd, I'd love to turn to, to David next to talk about how nurse hiring speed is an executive, um, an executive priority and how HR leaders are, and nursing leaders are working on this topic. Thank you, Iman, and thanks to everyone who's joined this uh, webinar. Obviously a very important topic, one that we all are very concerned about and very invested in. I think the first thing I just wanted to mention was just to acknowledge uh, what we've all been through with the pandemic and our nurses and nurse leaders in particular, and I, I want to give a shout out to nurse leaders and nurse executives who are on the call here. And thank you for your work, uh, working with our nursing colleagues and really just the partnership. I mean, this has been a time that we just can't imagine. And even though uh, we feel like we're emerging from this, I mean, there's still quite a bit of trauma and pain to deal with. There are some folks saying that there will be post-traumatic stress disorder people deal with. We know that a lot of nurses are tired uh, there's a, just a lot of fatigue. People are leaving the profession. And so this is really challenging and a difficult time. And I just want to thank everyone for the partnership, for you on the front line and the work that you've done to really help our organizations work through this. Uh, and I would say that for Stanford Healthcare, this notion of hiring speed really starts with the relationship between our nurse executive team and our human resource team. For us, it's got to be a joint priority that we share and that we really understand that being able to 
land top candidates does start with uh, this commitment to managing the process as quickly as possible. And so we do a lot of work to ensure that our, uh, our recruiting leaders are really consultants, that they work with the hiring managers. They understand their unique needs. They're in conversations with them as to what makes those specific units unique. Uh, for us, our nurse leaders have very uh, strict criteria around what they're looking for. And it's not only technical qualifications, in some cases, certifications, certainly BSN, we prefer uh, certain other technical experiences, but also just, um, uh, you know, motivation, uh, just their sense of uh, empathy and just how prepared they are to work in a place like Stanford. And so being able to know those unique needs and address those is very important. And so we have a partnership with the recruiters and the nurse leaders to understand those needs to be in regular dialogue uh, regarding that. Uh, we do many things to try to, once we understand those needs, as we go to market, uh, connect with candidates very quickly, very often initially by phone to talk about the units and what's uh, involved there, uh, the staffing, the acuity of patients, what a typical day is like, uh, what it feels like to work for Stanford Healthcare to ensure that we paint a realistic picture for the candidates uh, about that as early as we can. And then to schedule the interviews as quickly as possible and to ensure that as we're talking to candidates, in many cases, we also try to uh, involve them in multiple uh, hiring opportunities at the same time. So candidates, in some cases, might be presented with multiple opportunities and offers uh, at the same time so that we can actually maximize uh, the likelihood that we can actually find a fit for that nurse and get them here within Stanford. So that's something that we try to do in some cases, as many as three offers might be a, a proposed to the candidate based on uh, what they want and where they fit within the organization. Uh, but certainly, again, to check in with the leaders, making sure that we understand what uh, their needs are and that we're able to match the candidates to that. And then this notion of uh, same-day offers, and Eamon, you talked about that on your uh, notion around speed. We try to actually, once we interview the candidates, make an offer uh, the same day, if at all possible, uh, or the next day following at the latest, so that we can really be there uh, first once we uh, have sold the candidate on the opportunity uh, and we know that uh, they find it to be a good fit. Uh, don't let any time pass for them to change their mind for another employer to emerge or for anything actually to uh, interrupt the process, but to get them an offer as soon as possible and to be able to close on the candidates right away. And again, that's probably one of the things that we've found to be most successful in landing candidates and moving the process along. Great, thank, thank you, David. I mean, we know that we work with the Stanford team. They use Incredible Health as well. We know your nursing leaders are highly selective, as they should be, <laughs> um, and, and have many, many requirements, probably even more than, than nursing leaders at, at, at other employers. And so one of the key things your recruiting team does is educate them on the market, like, you know, almost like a reality check sometimes uh, on what, what the truth is in terms of what the, what the available candidate uh, pool is and the level of competition that there is for these candidates as well. Um, right. Dory, I'd love to, love to kind of hand, hand off to you. You're operationalizing uh, a lot of hiring uh, for nurses in, in your, at Yale. I'd um, love to hear some of the tactics that you've, you've implemented as well. Sure. So, you know, and, and David, I agree with you, uh, you know, just want to thank all the nurse leaders on this call and bedside leaders, um, you know, amazing work and over the last year, which has been very challenging. Um, one of the things that we've done and that David talked about is really trying to make that offer for within 24 hours. Um, one of the things that we do do is pre-screen our candidates. So um, we have a service level agreement um, with the recruiters and the nursing hiring managers. And what they do is we have a talent acquisition specialist that pre-screens the candidate, you know, ensuring that they, you know, um, understand the role, uh, really understand the schedule, um, you know, that they uh, meet all the qualifications, have the degrees and the certifications. Um, so what that the talent acquisition specialist does is then schedule them with the uh, the hiring manager and the recruiter, the talent acquisition partner, um, same day. So they try to get that done within 24 um, to 48 hours for the interviews. Um, one of the other things we do is we, during with our service level agreements, we have the manager block time for interviews. So if you have a position that is open, it is pertinent that you block your time to interview. If something comes up, we have a second person um, that has the decision-making to hire that nurse. 
Um, so we, we do that in conjunction with our service level agreements. The other thing we have uh, done is, you know, the recruiter schedule the interviews um, directly with the nurse managers, but also have a 24 hour follow up to the interview. So to make a decision on that candidate, if the candidate is not a good fit for that one department. We try to, you know, put that send that candidate off to another department that they think it would be a better fit. So they stay within the health system. And the other thing we've done is we had to pivot very quickly um, during COVID and work remotely. One of the things that we have found is what we went to Zoom interviewing and that has worked out very well. We find that the candidates are really comfortable. They're not driving and parking and really worried about getting to their interview on time. So we find that they're in a much more relaxed atmosphere at home. And you know, my recruiters have said that their interviews have gone very well. Great. And so, David and Dory, you're probably not going back to in-person interviews, I'm guessing, even post-COVID. <laughs> would you, would you right. agree with that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I would agree. I, I didn't mention the virtual interviews, but yes, that worked really well. I mean, I remember when we were thinking, you know, this couldn't be done, this wouldn't work, and, and it's turned out to actually be very efficient. Uh, I think the experience on both the candidate side and the hiring manager side uh, has been good. And so, yeah, we're sticking with that. It works really well. Got it. Okay, great. Uh, the next topic I want to cover as it relates to hiring is is the use of automation um, and and how many teams, in, including the Stanford team and others, have have embraced uh, the use of technology in hiring uh, because that you know that's what it takes in a market like this that it's highly competitive uh, to get the talent. Um, at Incredible Health, you know, hospitals use our custom matching technology to hire high quality permanent nurses in less than twenty days. In terms of the way our, our technology works, the employers are applying to the talent instead of the other way around. And as you can imagine, the nurses absolutely love that. We've also built in pre-screening and, and pre-vetting using our software and our data before the candidates are in front of the employers. And then also have custom matching algorithms for every single employer that we work with. So every, every nurse is matched to that employer based on preferences and, and specialties and locations and other requirements. And then tons of data analytics, get, you know, the advantage of being a marketplace technology is we have uh, not only, we have data, you know, a, a, a plethora of data, and we can even um, provide uh, benchmark data as well because other teams are using the platform as well. So uh, a lot of the data I'm about to show you, like some of the information I'm about to show you comes from over 350 hospitals and health systems across the country, including big ones like HCA in Providence, the academic centers like Stanford and Cedars, lots of community hospitals too. And uh, this is this is a model. This is actually a slide from the Stanford team, right? And it's really uh, explaining the uh, sort of a new n newer models in in talent acquisition uh, that are being adopted by many teams. So essentially, what's happening here is these are the first eight, these are the eight steps of the hiring process: from sourcing, you know, pre-screening, getting that recruiter phone screen scheduled, all the way to sending the offer and getting the offer accepted. And so, when when you're looking for a vendor, you definitely want a collaboration and a partnership. In our case, Incredible Health is doing a lot of the heavy lifting in the first four steps. So our software, our technology, our service is taking care of the sourcing, the pre-screening, making sure the candidate's actively looking, and automatically scheduling that very first uh, phone screen with the recruiters. At that point, the Stanford team has taken over, they, and they complete the recruiter phone screen, get the hiring manager interviews completed, get the offers out and accepted. What this enables is it enables that uh, recruiters and, and talent acquisition teams to effectively operate at the top of their license. We talk a lot about nursing, uh, nurses operating at the top of their license. I mean, even in HR, everyone needs to be operating at the top of their skill set. And what they are really good at, the top of their skill set, is the relationship building with hiring managers. It's the relationship building with candidates. It's not the things that can be done with automation, like sourcing and, and, and pre-screening. And, and you know interview scheduling, um, and so really we want to um, support them with some technology so they can free up time to do their high skill work. Um, so this is the kind of data that we we replicate for teams, and so without incredible health, it takes it, you know for many teams it could be sixty six days to fill. This is a case study from one of our California clients, and with incredible health it was at nineteen days. And where you saw the biggest impact was on time to source really getting that down from 44 days down to three. All right, so the next, the next uh, topic I'd, I'd love to cover is, is the topic of flexibility. And we know that both of your teams have embraced this as a key way to retain, uh, to retain nurses. Um, 
David, I'll, I'll turn to you first in terms of kind of what are, what are some of the uh, initiatives that you've implemented in order to provide more m more flexibility, frankly, for your permanent nurses? Uh, thanks, Imam. Well, the, first, I did just want to speak to uh, the technology because that has been really important to us. I, I think I mentioned yeah. at the outset that our recruiters are really talent acquisition consultants, and we really intend them to be focused on uh, the relationships and really providing value uh, in terms of connecting the hiring manager with the right candidates and doing that as efficiently, as quickly as possible. And so the technology really helps us get out of the paper business, really into the relationship and the consulting business. And so we've enjoyed certainly the value from Incredible Health's front end sourcing and screening technology. And then we also have put in Workday and we've worked hard to really automate processes on our end as well between our recruiters and our hiring managers to ensure uh, that the process does flow smoothly and above all very quickly. Uh, in terms of the shift preferences, I mean, we really have, uh, I think, tried to put the onus in the hands of the nurses uh, in terms of developing and designing shifts that meet their unique needs. And, and we have just found that uh, the more we can be innovative, flexible, and creative, the more we can land uh, the nurses. And we're certainly attracting nurses from uh, different broad uh, demographic uh, areas, people that are new in their career, folks who are mid and late career, their needs might be different. They might have young children and have certain needs there or might have aging parents and there might be specific uh, situations that they require accommodations for. And so we just try to really uh, provide a wide range of flexible options. 12-hour uh, shifts is uh, really a hallmark of how we staff, although we do other types of shifts as well, but we find that many of our nurses prefer the 12-hour shifts and that gives them more time off. Uh, we have added a lot of part-time positions, and that certainly gives flexibility, for example, for working moms who might have uh, care needs for their young children or otherwise. Uh, and so we are providing that. Uh, and uh, we essentially allow nurses to self-schedule. And so when it comes to actually uh, making out the schedule and determining when they're going to work, we put that again in the hands of the nurses so they have the opportunity uh, to schedule. And then the nurse leaders work to ensure that we have the coverage we need and that we fill the gaps with either part-timers or even travel nurses. But for our core nursing staff, we find that giving them as much control and as much flexibility as possible helps us both attract and retain uh, the nurses that we need. Great, and uh, David, you have a pretty good retention rate, right? I think it's 6% or something. It's dramatically lower than the national average. Um, one, of the re one of the top things that we see is one of the top reasons that drive turnover and nurses leaving is work-life balance, right? And so these are these are some tactics that you've implemented to counter to counter that. Is that would that be correct? That is correct, and and yep. you've sort of given the punchline here on our retention rates, uh, because yep. I think you showed a slide earlier that the average is uh, turnover is nineteen percent, uh, and uh, our turnover actually was higher uh, going back just uh, less than a couple of years ago, uh, somewhere around twelve percent a little bit higher even for some nursing. But we've really seen that number coming down uh, to where now we're right around 7% or in some cases a little bit lower than 7%. And, and that's, I mean, that's huge. You can certainly quantify that value economically. You can quantify that in terms of patient care continuity, uh, reducing errors. We know that turnover certainly creates lots of uh, risk in many respects. And so that, that number is just a huge, huge competitive advantage. But there are so many things we do uh, that play into helping us be able to uh, keep our uh, best uh, nurses. So I'm sure we'll talk about that as we go along. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Dory, did you want to comment at all on, on kind of more flexible options at Yale? Yeah, we're, we're actually following uh, David's model. We offer a lot of, um, you know, part-time positions, per diems, um, 312s, in some areas, 410s. Um, you know, part-time, we really try to be as flexible as possible to really accommodate um, the staff. Got it. Um, I, I did want to go uh, quickly back just to the technology topic, uh, Dory. Uh, we know that, you know, look, headcounts are not growing. <laughs> Budgets are not growing. And so one of the tactics that many leaders are doing is embracing tech automation because, frankly, it's, it's cheaper than adding more people. Curious just how about how you're thinking about um, embracing technology at, at Yale. So we have, you know, we embrace as much as we can of our applicant tracking system. Um, you know, we, we use, currently use iSIMS and we try to um, use it to the best of its capacity. Um, also working with um, partnering with a lot of departments 
um, especially IT, to see what some of the innovations that we can um, have, improvements, so that we can really, um, you know, make it. And I love what David said. It's uh, um, talking about, you know, making the talent acquisition a consultant and really giving them the tools that they need. So we're always looking at um, technology to improve, as you just said, we're not getting a lot more FTEs or, um, so yeah. I think we have to get creative with the, the technology to ensure that we're not missing any of these candidates. So we're working, you know, very diligently on that. Got it. Okay, okay so let's to improve it. <laughs> awesome. Um, all right, let's, let's go to the big topic of compensation and benefits. Uh, this is probably the number one uh, concern that has been highlighted by nursing and HR leaders in the last year hey, we're losing nurses to travel agencies because the travel agencies pay so much more, right? Um, now, I think both of you have implemented tactics to, to address this. Uh, Dory, I'll, 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 I'll go to you first in terms of how, how do you think about competing with travel agencies on compensation and kind of what's, what's your philosophy and strategy on it? So difficult, and I think everyone on this call would agree, difficult to, um, you know, really compete with them on compensation. So... What we do look for, though, is um, we, we have an internal uh, float pool. So we have one that's delivery network specific, hospital specific. And then we also have a system float pool. And we pay um, regular rates for the hospital float pools, but then we pay, pay, pay an incentive with um, differentials. Then for the system flow pool, we pay a higher flat rate um, because they travel, right? They travel, mm -hmm. they go throughout the health system. It really gives them a good, um, you know, visibility and, and really experience on different areas and different delivery networks. And so we, and then with the hospital ones, we try to, uh, we do even hire new grads um, into that, and they really, really enjoy it because it gives them a different experience by going all over the hospital for different departments. One of the things um, that we do do, you know, with and a travel agency, what we can do is we have really great um, competitive uh, compensation packages and benefit packages. We offer tuition reimbursement on day one. We offer benefits day one. So we really try to increase our benefit package so that that, you know, candidates really look forward to that where you're not always getting that with a traveler. Um, you know, and we, we truly you know, we try to l eliminate using travel agency as much as possible, which I'm sure everyone else on this call. But when we do need to use them, we really do um, welcome them and they really do feel part of our system. So sometimes we even get them to change over from a, being a travel uh, traveler to an employee. Got it. Okay. Um, uh, David, I know your team has done quite a lot of work on internal equity when it comes to compensation. would love to hear, hear a little bit more about, about that. Sure. So um, first, let me, let me just mention, and I actually saw a question in the chat about how does Stanford pay our nurses? And, uh, and I would say we, uh, we pay at the top of the market, uh, and we, I think, have really helped establish our brand partly by virtue of uh, the way that we compensate our nurses. And there are many things that go into that, including benefits and, and other things around professional fulfillment. Uh, but we typically don't have a challenge with uh, the uh, pay of our nurses vis-a-vis -vis the travel agencies. Uh, in fact, in some cases, we've maybe not paid as much in the travel agencies, and that's uh, maybe not helped us get as many travelers as we need. And so we're uh, trying to ensure that we create an environment that is both attractive for the travel nurses, because we do build them into our schedule and certainly depend on uh, having uh, travel agencies to augment our staff. And so we want to be competitive there as well. Uh, but really, it's not been an issue in terms of uh, losing uh, our, our nurses to travel agencies or trying to compete with them, because, again, we do have uh, really perhaps the strongest uh, if, or one of the strongest compensation programs in, in, the, in the market. And we work uh, tirelessly with our team to, uh, to benchmark that both externally and then also as we mentioned internally to review yep. compensation equity. And that is uh, sometimes a challenge as you're bringing in experienced nurses and you're trying to ensure that they're not being paid more uh, than the internal folks with similar experience. So we have just a lot of effort uh, to review that. Our 
comp team works with our uh, managers and our recruiters to ensure that we have visibility uh, into pay equity and that we're making the right adjustments and then moving people through uh, their pay bands uh, so that they're able to uh, stay at the right competitive rate. Great. All right, let's, let's dive deeper into the big, big topic of retention, um, which we touched on a little bit already, but we're gonna go, go even deeper now. So uh, there's several factors that influence uh, nurse retention. And this is, you can see this by you know, surveying nurses, by reading the academic research on it and so on, right? So uh, what, what keeps nurses, or what impacts nurse retention is uh, career, their career and educational opportunities that they have, like their career advancement opportunities. Um, how the system tackles burnout and resilience, uh, the, how good their managers are in terms of their leadership and their emotional intelligence, as well as social connections at work. These are some of the biggest factors that drive uh, nurse retention. So starting with um, you know, keeping, keeping, the, the, the nur uh, keeping the nurses that you already have and enabling them to advance their careers. I'll, I'll turn to Dory first to just hear a little bit more about your strategy when it comes to career advancement for, for nurses? Sure. So, you know, I'd like to actually go back to a new grad. Uh, we do have the Vizient uh, residency program, which is a year long mm -hmm. residency program. And we found it's, you know, it's a cohort of new hires that stay together. Um, we found that has really helped with retention and the career, right? So one leads into yep. the other. Um, we also have, you know, again, a generous tuition reimbursement program, which, you know, we really, um, you know, look at career planning. They can use the tuition reimbursement uh, program to go back to school as of uh, starting day one of their employment. Uh, we have a coaching and mentoring um, program. Uh, we also have career ladders and professional development that we offer. Um, and then, you know, one-on-one -on -one mentoring with their manager. And also we have uh, the Institute for Excellence, which has some amazing programs uh, for career advancement. One of the other things we do, we have a career passport program. So once an employee um, is in our health system after six months, they can fill out a, a you know, a career um, profile. And really, you know, if they want to become a CR, let's say they're a nurse and they want to become a CRNA, we can help them through that process in which we, you know, they have to have two years of ICU experience. Then we can say mm -hmm. to them, listen, we'll get you a position in ICU. And then, you know, you become a CRNA and then we obtain that. We keep them in our health system. Um, and we do have a formal mentorship uh, program. So we do a lot of um, a lot of different things. Um, and it's, you know, really catered to the individual. So we try to make sure that we really look at the individual and say, what is it that they need and, and keeping them within our health system for retention. Great. Great. And then, uh, David, I know your team has also done a lot of work in this area. Um, would love to hear a little bit more about the strategies and tactics you've implemented at Stanford to, draw, to, improve, to improve career advancement for nurses. Sure. And, you know, what, what I would say first is that this is really uh, the domain of our uh, nursing and patient care leadership teams. They've done a phenomenal job of creating a practice environment that really does attract and retain the best nurses. And so much has gone into that over the years, and whether it's magnet status, whether it's our professional nurse development program, uh, our uh, caring science philosophy. I mean, there's so many things we have done to make it a rich uh, practice environment, even the staffing ratios, uh, which are very generous uh, and really support our nurses in knowing that, that they have the coverage and the support they need uh, so that their work uh, isn't uh, overly stressful. And so we've invested a lot into that. And uh, so, for example, our a professional nurse development program really helps uh, support nurses as they grow in their careers, uh, helps actually they can earn additional compensation as they gain new skills, demonstrate clinical excellence, uh, get certifications, even they're rewarded for community service, uh, for working on quality programs and other initiatives. Uh, and so these are the things that really help them both advance financially, but also from a career uh, perspective. And we do many other things as far as rotations, uh, allowing folks to look at different career paths uh, within nursing to get different experiences. Uh, again, I mentioned supporting them through uh, getting certifications, which is really important. Uh, we also do uh, succession planning for nurses so that they have the opportunity to look at growing their career 
Our goal is that when a nurse comes here, they look at us as a destination employer. This is a place where I can have a full career and move through different levels of nursing, move into different specialty areas, or move up the uh, the ladder and even into leadership. And so, for example, when we opened our new hospital uh, nearly two years ago, and we had a lot of new patient care management roles, we filled 95% of those uh, with our own nurses. And so we didn't have to go outside and hire a bunch of uh, experienced nurses. We had been developing and grooming uh, our, our nurses so that we had many of them who could step into those leadership roles. And so being able to have that type of a career path is very powerful. And then we also, we haven't talked about this yet, but even the whole notion of of inclusion and diversity is also very important to us in trying to provide support there. We've been able to increase the diversity of our nursing leadership from 21% to 48% over the last couple of years and investing in that and also providing training for our leaders and for our staff around unconscious bias, around being inclusive leaders, things of that nature also enhance the professional de uh, development environment. And so many of those things we do make it a place where people come, they feel supported, they feel like they can grow in advance, uh, make this, again, a destination employer and stay here. And so I think that's the key part of what's contributed to our incredibly low uh, turnover rate. Got it. I like that phrase, destination employer. <laughs> that's great. Uh... And then, sorry, we also, sorry, I think both of you talked about cross-training as well um, as, as, as something that your, your teams proactively do. Um, and then love the, all, the thought, all the comments about financial support, you know, the tuition reimbursement uh, that you, you both mentioned. That's fantastic. All right, let's, let's go into this. This has been a, a very hot topic and, and a very real uh, issue in the last 12 months. Uh, the burnout uh, and, and resilience of, of nurses, they have probably worked hard, they know, even before the pandemic, they were working pretty hard. Uh, and during the pandemic, it got even more, even more intense. And so uh, teams across the country were dealing with some pretty substantial nurse burnout that was, that was happening. Um, so, uh, so from, we have a definition of, of, nurse, of burnout and what that means. And we'll borrow it from Christina Maslach at Berkeley. Uh, and it's a focus on emotional exhaustion, and it's defined as uh, nurses who feel overwhelmed, empty, uh, and low energy. So what are, what are some key tactics that your team has implemented and, and what you've created to do a burnout prevention strategy? Um, I know, uh, Dory, we'll, we'll, we'll start with you. <laughs> sure. So we do a lot of uh, manager, you know, connecting with staff. We have, um, we do weekly uh, town hall meetings with senior leadership, senior leadership um, rounding um, on all three shifts. We uh, encourage wellness programs on site. We also have a employee and family wellness program that we advertise very heavily. And it's, you know, really to, um, you know, think of, of self. Uh, we encourage PTO and we really try not to over schedule our staff and um, really encouraging some of those social connections also, because when you feel connected, you know, you have a buddy system, you have someone to go to, um, you know, it, it's a true thing, right? Especially with COVID, I think we all have noticed that, but I think it's those buddy system, we created a buddy system where you can connect with someone on your team so that, you know, hey, I'm just checking in, seeing how you're doing, to really eliminate some of that burnout and try to keep connected. Um, so we really, we work very, very diligently on that. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, D David, did you want to comment at all on um, your burnout strategies? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we've done quite a bit. Uh, we've mimicked some of the work on our uh, physician side. We have uh, perhaps a global leader on physician burnout, uh, Dr. Shanefeld, who's been here for about three years developing uh, all sorts of tools and approaches to prevent Physician burnout, we've leveraged some of those tools and experiences for uh, our nursing staff, APPs, and others. Uh, that's really helping. We did many things through the pandemic to support nurses from an overall uh, well-being, mental health perspective. And a lot of that just had to do with dealing with some of their specific physical needs, whether that was around food, child care, uh, making sure people had the time off they needed but also providing support uh, for additional emotional support, mental health and well-being. But uh, this also again has a lot to do with leaders and how leaders interact and making sure that our 
leaders are trained and supported. We use a very robust employee engagement program called Standout, allows leaders to check in with their teams either uh, through a, an app or, or directly uh, and in person, uh, providing support around helping identify the strengths of our, of our staff, helping them operate in their strengths uh, as often as possible, and just ensuring that uh, people are supported in the uh, work that they're doing. Um, also, uh, one of the things I, I find most compelling as to how we support our teams is through uh, our uh, clinical practice around uh, caring science. Uh, we subscribe to Gene Watson's uh, Caring Science Theory and have been really incorporated that into how we train and develop our nurses, how they interact with one another and with their patients, how they really come together to think about their, their own work and their own role and even their own personalization of their impact and to move beyond ego and to really focus on uh, caring and being authentic, supporting uh, the patients and, and the community and really providing that additional level uh, of, of support that that I think transcends just uh, you know the tactics in the day to day and really looks at it from a larger community uh, well being perspective and so I think things of that nature really help us both support our teams as well as our leaders uh, throughout the stress that they deal with on a day to day basis. Got it. All right, so let's let's now uh, switch to the topic of managers, you know. And then there's a cliche, you know, saying, and it's it's, it's kind of true that people don't quit their jobs; they quit their managers. Um, and so nurse managers can practice caring behaviors to help uh, their nurses reduce stress. Love to hear from each of you around uh, some of the programs that you've implemented in order to uh, improve manager, uh, manager, nurse manager training, uh, because that has a pretty deep impact on, on retention as well. Uh, Dory, you wanna go first? So we provide a manager training program um, through our Institute yeah. for Excellence. Uh, and also offer one-on-one -on -one mentoring, um, you know, to develop and support the managers. So really, if it's a new manager or a manager who really needs that support, we're there to make sure that they know um, that there's um, a lot of tools available to them. So, you know, we do do professional development programs. Um, uh, interview, I, I see that you have the interview selection training. We, we do a lot around that. We have a interview selection uh, training program. Um, and then the, the recruiters work with their leaders to ensure, especially if it's a new leader, here's our, uh, we kind of give them a script, you know, and some interview yeah. questions that they can utilize. Um, and so those are some of the things that we've done and really be supportive of our managers, um, you know, because we really need them. We want them to be successful. Absolutely. Uh, you know, some of the research back behaviors uh, that you can find in the academic studies around how that nurse managers can practice is things implementing tactics like debriefing after a patient death, making sure the staff are getting their meal breaks, uh, making sure that where they're meaningfully recognizing uh, their nurses. Uh, David, I'll turn to you next in terms of what you're doing in terms of uh, management training, um, as well as how, how you're recognizing nurses as well. Yeah, lots being done there. And certainly we have programs from human resources that we uh, leverage. I was mentioning our employee engagement work and a big part of that is around uh, leader support and coaching uh, and development in terms of how they debrief with their teams, how they follow up on uh, some of the action plans, as well as how they follow up on the, on the check-in. So there's lots of specific uh, training and support from that. Also, I was talking to one of our nurse leaders recently about some work that they're doing around what we call the inclusive leader. And so we have a big focus on inclusion and diversity right now. And so we are uh, training leaders around how to be inclusive leaders. We have looked at research around what makes a person an inclusive leader and how does that drive uh, both the work environment uh, and the experience of employees, their retention, uh, and also how it helps uh, address some of the issues of, of injustice and inequity that occurs in the workplace. And so through that research, there are six C's uh, of inclusive leaders, things like cultural intelligence, uh, curiosity, uh, things like uh, competence, and uh, just really expanding their own view of cultures and things of that nature. So we provide training uh, in those areas. We provide some actually real scenarios within our own organization of things that have maybe gone wrong with a, a patient interaction uh, where there was an issue of maybe a, a diverse patient or or nurse where an experience occurred that uh, really wasn't appropriate. And so we use those to learn from and to de debrief that uh, so that we have actually a more reality-based uh, conversation 
and that helps with the retention and also uh, helps in terms of knowledge retention and also helps make that experience uh, much more robust and powerful. And then in terms of uh, recognition, uh, we have lots of recognition programs uh, that are provided, many of them, again, through nursing, uh, through the nurse leadership program as to how they uh, identify nurses, how nurses can actually uh, even uh, go online and uh, reward one another, recognize and call out the performance of one of their peers or coworkers. Uh, many uh, things that our nurse leaders are doing to highlight nurses. We, we have celebrations uh, and might be based on uh, either a specific patient care interaction or a letter from a patient, or it may just be uh, an annual award just based on the excellence that a nurse has shown throughout the year. And so there are many of those uh, programs that I think really help nurses feel appreciated, allow managers ways to uh, provide both short and then longer term recognition for excellence from a nursing perspective. Got it. And uh, David, I know your team has nurses, nurses and nursing leaders participate in several committees. Could, could you tell us a little bit more about, about that? Yes. Yeah, so this is also something I find really exciting is just our whole process of, of shared governance, for example. And so, as, as many of you know, shared governance really allows nurses to uh, have a role uh, as part of various committees who are improving. Uh, it might be a clinical program. They might be involved in research. Uh, they might be looking at specific issues of workflow uh, or whatever the case may be, or even looking at, at different policies and approaches to how care is delivered and how uh, work is handled on certain units, but it really gets them uh, vested in improving quality, uh, taking ownership, and so that uh, nurses feel empowered. They feel like they're part of the conversation and they can actually identify projects to work on or be part of uh, activities that are underway to improve uh, work life and ultimately improve patient outcomes. So to me, this is one of the things that has been very helpful uh, as far as uh, nurses who want to step forward, uh, who see themselves as leaders and have the opportunity from their role as a staff nurse uh, to be involved in decision making and providing leadership and helping improve quality as well as uh, efficiency within the units. Great. Okay, the last topic we'll cover before we dive into Q&A is the social connections at work. And there's many things that your teams have implemented to facilitate social connections in the workplace. And it's another, it's another great way to help nurses manage stress and it also improves, improves retention too. Uh, Dory, I'll, I'll turn to you because uh, I think your team's done quite a bit of work here. Uh, would love, love to hear uh, some of the tactics you, you've implemented. Sure. Um, so alongside of a lot of what David just said, we have a lot of the same programs. So that encourages social connections also and, you know, helps along with, uh, you know, really helping with uh, career development. One of the things we do do is we have a we created a new week of um, gratitude um, this past March. We kicked it out, uh, kicked it off and uh, we had a huge team, uh, our c &E, our chief nursing um executive was part of it. Uh, it was amazing. And so we have now implemented that. We're going to be doing this every year. Um, and it was an opportunity for leaders to round, but with a different, um, you know, just a thank you. Thanks for all that you do and listen to the employees. That's really, that really was very, very beneficial. Um, we also have a, like a Daisy award. Uh, we have a great catch award so and we always start off all our meetings um with a patient story so many times in that patient story it is uh, in combination with a amazing employee story something they've done for the patients um patients well-being and and so really that fosters a lot of that connection uh we also have a nightingale award um i've mentioned the Visient residency program which is amazing um, nurses week, we have hospital week, um, and again, the leadership rounding in which we do on all. And so really all of that is to foster the connections. Um, we really um, ensure that people are, you know, uh, nurses are taking their breaks um, and lunch breaks. And we do have uh, break rooms in which we, you know, they can foster that connection with one another. Um, and also, um, you know, we do a lot with cross team activities. A lot of that even comes from the employees themselves. Um, yep. You know, they really want to uh, connect and engage. So we find that, you know, we have that, we have, we foster that environment in which we make it possible. So, you know, I'm sure there's probably a ton more social connections that I'm not mentioning, but we do have, we, you know, we foster that every, all, every day. 
Great, thank you, thank you, Dory. All right, let's dive. In. Let's. Uh, we have ten minutes left to do uh, to uh, to do some Q and A. We know that lots of questions have already been submitted, so we'll just kind of go through with as many as we can before we run out of time. Um, if anyone has additional questions uh, that maybe we don't get to, or that, or you know, others that you think of, please feel free to reach out. Or we, we put our email, and we'll make sure that you know you get you get an answer. Um, okay, let's dive in. So, one question. Um, how, how have your CNOs partnered with you to improve retention? And that's like, maybe we'll, we'll give that to Dory first. Sure, I mean, what I just mentioned was a um, week of gratitude, but we have, I, I and I, you know, I'm gonna pre preface this by saying it goes back to those relationships we build. Um, Human Resources here at Yale New Haven Health has a phenomenal relationship with the nursing leaders, the CNOs, our CNE, um, and, I think all of that is what really, um, you know, any ideas we have or any ideas they have, we really are collaborative and really institute a lot of these programs together. So I think that's, it. It, it, it's so important that we foster that. Absolutely. All right, this next question, I think, David, this one's for you. Um, what role does employee engagement play in nurse retention and, and how have you measured this? Yes. Yeah, so employee engagement is really, a key part of our uh, overall retention program. Uh, we use uh, the Marcus Buckingham Company's tool. It's an eight question survey that we conduct typically every quarter uh, and we're measuring engagement uh, and then we're able to provide those results to the teams and they're working on uh, improving engagement based on what comes out of their uh, engagement survey. Uh, but the other part of it is the, the check-in. I think I mentioned earlier that uh, part of our engagement process is a weekly check-in where the, the employee can go into the standout tool and answer a few questions and it gives information to their leader uh, about how they're doing, what they need, about their loves and loathes so that we can identify their strengths and how to make sure that they're working within their strengths. And it really has helped us uh, provide some additional hands-on support and tools for leaders to be able to connect with their staff in powerful ways. And, and we measure everything within our a standout tool in terms of the, the check-ins, uh, the leader attention as to how they follow up on the check-ins, and then all of those things and how they translate into uh, retention. And we have seen that as we grow engagement, uh, that our turnover goes down. Uh, we've also measured that uh, for nurses who uh, are considering leaving, their engagement starts to reduce as early as uh, nine months before they actually leave. And so we know that as we're identifying where we have lower engagement, addressing that is going to uh, help us build turnover. Uh, and the, again, when we talk about the check-ins, we know that leaders who check in with their staff more frequently have lower turnover, the more frequently employees check in, the higher uh, their engagement and the lower their turnover. And so all these numbers and metrics really help us know how to support and focus our teams. But as we look across the organization and our engagement is growing, again, we see our turnover rates uh, decreasing significantly. Got it, okay. Uh, the, the next question was about this this slide. Um, the question was regarding hiring speed. What <clears throat> what complement of resources or what resources are available in the model that you discussed? How many recruiters? Um, a, you know, talent versus nursing leaders. Um, then you know the number of applicants per position. You know, the average number of open positions per recruiter. These are all key like HR metrics, of course. Um, we, we I can share some some of the data that we that we have. Um, First, it's important to acknowledge that not all, not all recs are created equal, okay? There are some recs that are very easy to fill and there's some that are very tough. And so we can't just take a blanket, oh, this is the number of recs per recruiter because uh, not all recs are the same. So when you look at specialized nurses and experienced nurses, those tend to be the harder, harder uh, job recs. And we see anywhere across the country, we see anywhere from as low as 60 to 120 or more sometimes recs per recruiter. Now, to be perfectly honest, and we see it across our platform, once you're over 80 recs, nursing recs per recruiter, you start to like, the service level starts to like dissolve, to be honest, right? It starts to get worse, right? And so uh, many HR leaders try to kind of try to like maintain that ratio if they can. Um, David, did you, want, do you want, did you want to comment at all on this? And just, you know, the question was more about this model and kind of how, how you operationalize it. Yeah, um, I, I probably don't have all the details in terms of the numbers. I mean, I can I can help get yep. that and provide it back. But uh, I, I think you you've uh, done a good job on it. Okay. Got it. Um, now that we got a, a question come in about shadowing, 
is shadowing part of your interview experience. Very controversial because we know it slows down speed, <laughs> but you know some nursing managers really like it. Uh, Dory, curious about your your team's philosophy on on shadowing and when it comes into the process. Yes, we do. Um, we uh, we do do shadows. Um, it is requested many times by either the nurse leader or the uh, candidate themselves. They want to come in. They want to see, um, you know. During COVID, we obviously were not able to do that. And the request for us to return to that has been uh, tremendous. So it does help. I, th I think it gives them a different aspect. It really, they get to meet the staff. They get to feel that connection. We believe it really helps with the recruitment. I know it slows down the process a little bit, but at the end of the day, I think it really makes for a great candidate experience. Um, Dory, does it block an offer from being sent? Or not? Is it required or is it optional? No, it's uh, it is not required. Sometimes I think that conversation happens with the nurse leader, though, and the candidate, and they're like, sometimes they'll say, "Don't make the offer yet. We really want to bring them in and show them a couple of different areas." Um, so, but we are talking to the candidate and ensuring keeping them warm, letting them know, you know, this is not stopping our process, but we want to make this a great experience for you. So, you know, it. it once in a while it goes that it, it does it you know it extends the time of the offer but that's because it's communicated with the candidate and the nurse leader got it okay um we've act, uh, the many employer teams we work with we've actually seen it kind of all over the place we have some teams who are absolutely strict and they're like no shadowing we are not slowing down the hiring process right um, shadowing is an optional. In fact, you can come in and shadow after your offer, <laughs> after you sign. Um, and whereas we, we have others that have more flexibility. So it, re it really varies by team. Um, okay, the next question was just around, again, around hiring, around peers in the interview process. I know both of you have standardized some of your interview processes um, in terms of limiting the number of hiring manager interviews required to make a decision. Uh, curious just to hear a little bit more about the role of peers in the interview process and, and kind of how, how you think about that piece. Uh, Dory, you want to go first? Sure. Um, one of the things, and you're right, to, to make the process faster, right, you have to eliminate some of those um, interviews. Um, what we do do is when they do come in in shadow, if, if that is part of it, um, they meet all their peers or many of their peers. So I think that really has helped even when they're hired. Um, but I think the managers have a good pulse on their areas. Um, I think they get a lot of feedback from their um, the employees' peers, um, peers, and so I think it's it's been working. But we don't go through a formal, you know, here we're going to meet with your peers because the process would just take too long. But I think they do get a lot of feedback, um, the nursing managers from the peers, like what is it that we're looking for? Got it. This next question is for David. Um, do you offer flexible options to external candidates as well as internal? We do. Uh, and as a matter of fact, that's part of the reason why we're so successful in landing a lot of candidates is being able to provide that flexibility. And again, whether that's uh, the, the length of shifts, uh, certainly the type of locations where they're going to work uh, part time, full time, you know, as many ways as we can be flexible, uh, we want to provide that. And similarly, again, to our own workforces, they're growing in their career as their needs may change at different points within their own life cycle, looking for ways to ensure that they can stay because we, we want people to stay and again grow with us and if that means uh, considering other options for them that are going to meet their particular uh, family needs, work-life balance needs, educational needs, whatever the case may be, flexibility is, is, is really critical. Got it. Okay. I think we're just about at time. Um, there were still another 30 or so questions, no more, almost 60 questions submitted. Um, so we'll try, to, we'll try to get back to everyone via email as well. Um, but just want to, uh, Dory and David, just want to thank you so much for joining and sharing your insights and your tactics uh, with everyone on the call. Um, and hope every, just wishing everyone a, a great day. And we will follow up. We will certainly, you know, everyone will be, who registered and attended will be receiving the recording as well. And, uh, and the Incredible Health team will follow up um, to, in case you had any questions or, or wanted to book a demo or anything like that. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks.